The anime opens with Suguru Geta walks through dark alleyways, hunting for cursed spirits during a busy summer when they were appearing frequently. Down this alley, Suguru finds a cursed spirit feeding on a deceased man and quickly absorbs it with his cursed spirit manipulation. Suguru feels he is the only one who understands how taxing the process of absorbing curses is when he has to taste their filth. He's been repeating morally focused statements to himself on repeat to try and keep himself composed ever since that day. It all began in 2006. Grade 1 Sorcerer Mei Mei and Grade 2 Sorcerer Yuta Haimayori are given a mission to investigate a cursed mansion ripe with paranormal activity and missing victims in Hamamatsu City. An assistant manager drives to the location and Yuta Haim begins preparing to cast a curtain. Mei Mei interrupts Yuta Haim and tells her that won't be necessary because they'll be exercising the curse inside the building. The two sorcerers enter the abandoned house and make note of the trash and filth laid about throughout every room of it. Yuta Haim is frightened while Mei Mei stays composed and suggests that they split up to investigate each floor individually. Yuta Haim reluctantly agrees but the two encounter each other on the same floor before long. Mei Mei reveals that she's passed by the same trail of garbage three times already and Yuta Haim ponders if the cursed spirit has them trapped in its innate domain. Mei Mei notes the environment hasn't changed and explains that a domain is a manifestation of the mindscape. In this case, they're trapped within a barrier that was likely used to capture victims of the cursed spirit. Mei Mei is confident the cursed spirit they are looking for is weak and they can exercise it as long as they escape the barrier. She asks Yuta Haim what their best course of action is as a way to quiz her. By pacing down the hallway repeatedly, Yuta Haim figured out the hallway isn't in the shape of a circle but a straight line that the barrier is patching together as the sorcerers move along it. She believes that by running down the hallway at top speed, they'll be able to break the barrier once it's incapable of keeping up. Mei Mei gives Yuta Haim's idea 90 out of 100 points because she adds that they should run in opposite directions as well. Yuta Haim and Mei Mei put their plan into action and it appears successful at first. However, Yuta Haim quickly realizes the entire mansion is being ripped apart by some unknown force. She jumps outside the building and survives falling beneath some rubble. Once the entire building has been destroyed, Yuta Haim climbs out of the debris and finds her junior, Satoru Gojo, who has come to her rescue. The barrier distorted the girl's sense of time while they were inside it. Second year Tokyo Jujutsu High students, Satoru Gojo, Suguru Ghetto, and Shoko Iiri were dispatched as reinforcements after two days. Yuta Haim yells at Satoru for being so reckless and a giant cursed spirit springs up from the ground to attack her. Suguru uses an even larger curse to immobilize it within its mouth. He tells Satoru not to tease Yuta Haim but ends up just making fun of her more. Yuta Haim greets Shoko, the only one she's happy to see and tells her not to turn out like the boys. Shoko assures Yuta Haim she would never end up as garbage like Satoru and Suguru. Mei Mei realizes that she'll be getting two days labor pay out of this assignment and then asks the students about the curtain. Satoru, Sugiru, and Shoko are all stumped as no one put up the barrier. Everyone returns to Jujutsu High and Masamichi Yaga disciplines his students. He asks which of the trio claimed they would put up a curtain themselves and left their assistant manager behind only to forget to cast it. Sugiru and Shoko are quick to point out Satoru. Masamichi physically punishes Satoru and the students move on to recreational time in the gym. While Shoko plays with Satoru's glasses, he claims to not see the necessity for hiding jujutsu from non-sorcerers. Satoru finds protecting the weak exhausting while Suguru believes that is the very duty of every jujutsu sorcerer. Satoru mocks Suguru for his ideals and their conversation escalates in tension. Shoko runs away while Suguru summons a curse and threatens Satoru to take things outside. Satoru replies with a smart remark just before Masamichi bursts into the room and reveals they've received a mission. The two strongest are to escort the Star Plasma vessel to Master Tenjin and erase her. Satoru and Suguru are confused about the eraser part of the mission and taunt Masamichi for letting his promotion go to his head. Satoru is confused about the Star Plasma vessel and its relationship to Tenjin. Masamichi and Suguru explain that Tenjin's innate technique must be refreshed by merging with the Star Plasma vessel, or else they could evolve into a threat to humanity. The vessel's location has been leaked and two groups of curse users are after them. Q and the Time Vessel Association. Masamichi reveals the merger is set for two days from now and officially gives the students their task to protect the girl and escort her safely back to Jujutsu High. Satoru and Suguru leave school and the former asks why the Time Vessel Association would be after the Star Plasma Vessel. Suguru explains that they're a group of non-curse users who view the merger as an impurity to their diet. They arrive at the hotel where the vessel is staying. Suguru goes inside to secure them while Satoru remains outside. 
They remain in communication over the phone where Satoru overstates his confidence regarding why he was chosen for this mission. As Suguru approaches the target's room, he reprimands Satoru for his arrogance. Suguru rings the doorbell and a girl replies that she's coming when suddenly a bomb explodes. Suguru uses a cursed spirit to shield himself from the blast and sees the girl falling out of the building. He summons a flying cursed spirit to catch the girl before she falls to her death. Q soldier, Kokun arrives to confirm the kill with the vessel's attendant in hand only to find Suguru taunting. Meanwhile, a second Q soldier, Bayer, sends several knives at Satoru while he's still on the phone. The knives are stopped by his infinity and Bayer commends Satoru, recognizing his name for being famous. He challenges Satoru and the Jujutsu High student tells him that he won't kill him as long as the curse user begs for mercy. Inside a nearby skyscraper, two men watch from glass windows as Q attempts to assassinate the Star Plasma vessel. Shu Kong offers a man he calls Zen in a contract to kill the vessel. The man clarifies that he goes by Fushiguro now and accepts the job. Suguru casually makes himself some tea while one of his cursed spirits has Koken restrained. The curse user is completely immobilized with only one arm free to resist the cursed spirit constantly trying to lick and kiss him. While Riko and her caregiver are both unconscious and safely positioned on a couch, Suguru sits down opposite them and pretends he can't hear Koken. Irritated, Koken boasts that Bayer, Q's strongest soldier, will make Suguru regret this. However, Suguru receives a picture message from Satoru that Bayer was easily defeated, and he shows Koken. With Bayer's defeat, Q disbands as an organization shortly after. Shu Kong, the middleman for the Time Vessel Association, finds Toji, who was just hired to hunt the Star Plasma vessel betting on races that he apparently never wins. Shu asks why Toji hasn't been pursuing the Star Plasma vessel and Toji explains that he won't be able to take on Satoru head-on. He claims to be using the initial deposit from the Time Vessel Association to wear him down without elaborating. Toji loses his bet on the race and Shu tells him he's not cut out for gambling. Before he leaves, Shu tells the sorcerer killer that he's counting on him and asks about Megi. However, Toji can't manage to remember who that is. Back at the hotel with the Star Plasma vessel, Satoru and Suguru discuss if they should take the girl to a doctor. They wish they could use reverse curse technique like Shoko but she's always been terrible at explaining how it works. The Star Plasma vessel, Riko Aminai, wakes up and smacks Satoru. She assumes a battle stance and threatens both boys because she doesn't believe they're on her side. Her caregiver, Misato Kuroi, enters the room and finds the boys bullying Riko before explaining they're all on the same side. Satoru states Riko is different from what he expected considering she's going to be assimilated into Tenja. Riko embraces her role as the Star Plasma Vessel and proudly states that she is Tenjin and Tenjin is her. Satoru and Suguru casually ignore and taunt Riko, annoying the young girl. A joke about her not having any friends makes Riko realize that she's missing school. At her request, everyone goes to Renchoku Girls Junior High. Satoru argues that they should return to Jujutsu High but Masamichi explains over the phone that fulfilling all of Riko's quests is a part of Tenjin's orders as well. Misato adds that Riko lost her family at a young age and she wants her to enjoy her last day with her friends. Suguru smiles and says that Misato is her family, honoring her. He's posted a bounty on Riko using the deposit from the Time Vessel Association, leading several curse users to move in on her. Suguru goes to confront the curse users while Satoru and Misato search for Riko to evacuate her. Shu calls Toji while he's at the restaurant and informs him that the girl isn't at Jujutsu High yet. He also reminds Toji that he'll lose his deposit if someone else takes out the girl. Not only that, but the Time Vessel Association may claim they could have used the bounty in the first place and refuse to reward him for the finished job. Unfazed, Toji explains that Satoru Gojo is the first person to inherit both the Limitless and the Six Eyes in hundreds of years. He's confident nobody will get to the girl with Satoru guarding her and tells Shu the bounty up for another 47 hours. After the time limit expires, Toji wants Shu to get the money back and hangs up the call when he protests. Back at Riko's school, Suguru encounters an elderly curse user who summons two simple Shikigami. Suguru recognizes that he covered his flank with a Shikigami after seeing his opponent's uniform, assuming there would be multiple enemies from Jujutsu High. He summons cursed spirits and the curse user notices that they're not Shikigami. He believes Suguru fears close combat and begins to formulate a plan. However, Suguru suddenly summons a giant worm-like curse that fills the hallway and appears to swallow his opponent. Suguru turns around to leave when suddenly the curse user bursts through the window behind him. His life flashes before his eyes. Suguru beats him down with superior hand-to-hand -hand combat, 
and reveals he was leading him into a close-range encounter the entire time. After beating the old man senseless, Suguru asks if he's with Q or the Time Vessel Association. Satoru runs into Riko's music class and gets the attention of all the girls, including the teacher. He leaves with Riko shortly after and although she's upset, she understands that Satoru is trying to prevent her friends from getting caught up in the fighting. A curse user with a bag mask spots Satoru carrying Riko away. Misato confronts the curse user and even overpowers him with a well-timed low blow. Suguru joins her shortly after and admits he's impressed with her skills. He reveals the information he received from the curse user while also trying to call Satoru. There is a bounty on Riko's head posted on the dark web for curse users with a time limit of 11 am the next day. This conversation confirms that Riko is the target for the curse user and his body suddenly melts. Suguru calls Satoru to warn him but he and Riko are already surrounded by four clones of that very same curse user. He makes a fifth clone, but Satoru slams it into another clone using curse technique laps, blue. Two more clones rush him head on but are stopped by the infinity before being easily dispatched. Satoru reveals that his opponent's innate technique allows generate up to five clones including the main body, and he can decide which of them is the main body at a moment's notice. The curse user asks how his opponent could know this and Satoru replies that he has good eyes. Satoru goes on to divulge his own technique, further explaining how blue in the forward activation of the technique works. The curse user flees but Satoru uses blue to attract them both to a single point. He attempts to use curse technique reversal, red but it fails to activate, as Satoru has yet to master reverse curse technique. Satoru comically declares that he failed and then simply punches the curse user to defeat him. Riko has been along for the ride the entire time with Satoru using his power to levitate her next to him. She gets a message on her cell phone and is shocked to find that she's received a message that Masato has been kidnapped. Masato Kirai was kidnapped by non-curse users when Suguru left her side to aid Satoru in protecting Riko. The two of them regroup and discuss the situation and their options. Riko wants to help but Satoru remains resolute that he will leave her behind if it harms Kiroi's chances of survival. He also warns her that they'll ignore any cries to go on home on the mission if she comes along. The rescue is effortlessly pulled off and the four of them relax and play on a beach in Okinawa. They took a plane and thoroughly checked everyone on board after the kidnappers chose Okinawa for the exchange. Hirai asks Suguru if the enemy plans to take over the airport and trap Riko in Okinawa to prevent her from reaching the merger in time. Suguru reveals they've considered the possibility and backup has already been deployed to patrol Naha Airport. The two assigned to the task are none other than Jujutsu High first year students Kento Nanami and Yuhebara. Nanami doesn't believe this is an assignment for the first years, but Hebara encourages him to do his best to make their hardworking senpai proud. Meanwhile, these hardworking senpai are still fooling around on the beach when Satoru decides to return to Jujutsu High the next day instead of that night. Suguru is concerned because Satoru hasn't released the infinity or slept since the mission began. Satoru reassures him because he knows that his best friend is also here to watch his back. Hebara enthusiastically informs Nanami that they're staying the night, only serving to irritate him. Satoru and Suguru do their best to make Riko's last days memorable using their tropical setting. They take her sightseeing, to a fancy dinner, and to an aquarium where Riko is mesmerized by the fish. He next day, the escort mission returns to Jujutsu High, and the timer on Riko's bounty ends. Suguru commends Satoru for working hard and the latter finally releases his infinity. He expresses his desire to never babysit again when a sword suddenly pierces through his chest. Toji Fushiguro stabs Satoru from behind, surprising everyone there. Suguru doesn't understand how he got inside the barrier and Satoru asks if he's ever met this man before. While still holding the blade through Satoru's chest, Toji admits he's also not the type to remember some guy's name. Toji went to go see Satoru when he was a child to see the six eyes. It was the only time in Toji's life that anyone ever noticed him standing behind them. Toji knew that he had to wear down the six eyes bearer until his senses dulled if he was going to pull off a successful sneak attack. Satoru uses blue to send Toji into the air, and then Suguru summons his giant worm-like curse to devour the assassin. Suguru checks on Satoru's wound, but the latter assures him that all his vitals were missed by then he used cursed energy to reinforce himself. Satoru is confident he can handle the assassin and tells Suguru to complete the escort. Toji slices his way out of Suguru's cursed spirit with a different sword from the one he used to stab Satoru. Not only that, but there is a cursed spirit wrapped around his Toji's body as well. Oji expresses that he's gotten rusty and admits that he meant to kill Satoru with the initial attack. Satoru reveals that the bounty time limit has expired and Toji replies that he's the one who set it. 
Toji tells Satoru that he had to create false goals and use the timer because the Six Eyes Bearer may not have otherwise released the Infinity until the mission was complete. Satoru tries to hit Toji with blue, but he avoids it with blistering speed. Then he uses the cursed spirit wrapped around him to swap out weapons. Satoru realizes that not only is Toji fast, but he also has zero cursed energy and a heavenly restriction that grants him immense physical prowess. Toji zips around unpredictably at breakneck speeds but Satoru catches him with blue upon his approach and launches him through several buildings. Satoru taunts his opponent about not letting him get in close with his new weapon until he realizes that Toji is gone. He can't track Toji's movements because Toji doesn't have any cursed energy and is moving too fast. In response, Satoru clears out the immediate area with a maximum output, blue to leave the assassin no cover. However, Toji releases a swarm of fly heads that act as chaff smoke to occupy Satoru's senses. The fly heads are halted by Satoru's infinity, but this has created more blind spots despite his earlier efforts. Satoru fears that Toji has gone after Riko, and makes the fatal mistake of turning his back. The sorcerer killer takes advantage of his opponent going on the defensive and pierces through the infinity, stabbing Satoru in the neck with special grade curse tool, Inverted Spear of Heaven. It can forcibly stop any curse technique it comes into contact with. Before Satoru can effectively react, Toji slashes him numerous times across his body and legs before stabbing him in the brain with a second non-cursed tool knife. Victorious, Toji smiles and claims he's starting to get his edge back. Suguru escorts Riko and Kuroi to the tunes of the star. Once they descend the elevator, Riko and Kuroi share a heartfelt goodbye and Suguru takes her down a hallway to a platform that overlooks the main hall. He gives her instructions to reach Tenjin and also gives her a choice to return home with Kuroi if she so chooses. This surprises and confuses Riko. Suguru reveals that their teacher, Masamichi Yaga, called the merger an erasure so that his students would understand the weight of the event. Satoru and Suguru agreed that they would support the vessel's decision no matter what, even if it meant fighting Tenjin. Riko admits that she had accepted that she was special, and that merging with Tenjin was her fate. But then she gets emotional and tells Suguru that she wants to keep living alongside everyone. Suguru extends his hand to take her home when she's suddenly shot in the head and dies right in front of him. Toji reveals himself and tells Suguru to go home since the escort has failed. Shocked and confused, Suguru asks why Toji is in the tombs of the star. With an elated grin, Toji proudly states it's because he's killed Satoru Gojo. Irate, Suguru summons two powerful cursed spirits, Rainbow Dragon and Kuchisake Ana in response and tells Toji to die. Right before Suguru's eyes, Toji shoots Riko dead. Toji assures Suguru he can go since the escort mission is a failure. Suguru asks why Toji is there and the assassin reveals he killed Satoru Gojo. Suguru tells Toji to die and sends Rainbow Dragon after him. The cursed spirit rams into Toji and crashes through several buildings. Even so, Toji casually fires his handgun while being dragged by the dragon, forcing Suguru to summon a cursed spirit to block the bullets. Suguru heads down to a lower area of the Tombs of the Star where Toji gets away from the dragon. Toji tells Suguru not to be so impatient and starts walking around the upper floor of the partially wrecked building they're both in. While Toji explains why barriers are ineffective against him, Suguru uses the sound of his footsteps to target him. He attempts to attack from the floor below, but Toji's speed easily outmaneuvers Suguru's curse projectiles. Toji continues to explain how he moves through barriers with a curse spirit and curse tools, but Suguru interrupts him. Suguru asks how Toji found them without them leaving even the slightest residuals of cursed energy behind. Toji reminds Suguru that humans leave behind footprints and a scent. He tracked them the orthodox way using enhanced senses from his heavenly restriction. Suguru's last question inquires about Misato Kiroi but Toji casually tells him that she's probably dead. Infuriated, Suguru sends Rainbow Dragon out again and takes Toji into the skies. Suguru also barrages his opponent in mid-air with numerous cursed spirit projectiles, but Toji brushes them all off one after another. Toji even splits Rainbow Dragon down the middle with a single attack, the cursed spirit in Suguru's arsenal with the toughest hide. The sorcerer killer lands in the same structure as his opponent, completely unimpressed with cursed spirit manipulation. Rainbow Dragon's remains fall and destroy the wrecked building's support and cause the platform to fall. It falls straight down as it skids down the sides of more buildings until it's caught in Kuchisake Ana's barrier. Kuchisake Ana's simple domain enforces non-violence between her and Toji until he answers her question, Am I pretty? Toji quickly analyzes the cursed spirit and tells her she's not his type. Dissatisfied with this response, several scissor blades suddenly appear, already in range and poised to snipe off several of Toji's limbs. 
However, Toji quickly gets the inverted Spear of Heaven from his own cursed spirit, and deflects all the blades with immense speed. Suguru uses the distraction to get behind his opponent, but Toji calls him a fool for coming in close. Suguru attempts to absorb the cursed spirit to nullify Toji's arsenal, but it rejects him. Suguru is surprised and Toji uses the opening to cut him down with a katana, and finishes the fight with a fierce kick. This all takes place in the time it takes for the platform to finally crash to the ground. Toji spares Suguru because he doesn't know what will happen to the cursed spirits he absorbed if he dies. Before leaving, Toji taunts Suguru and says that with all their blessings, these sorcerers couldn't defeat a monkey who can't even use jujutsu. After saying blessings out loud, Toji is reminded of his son, who he finally remembers he named Megumi. Toji gives Riko's body to the Time Vessel Association and their representative, Shaidru Sonoda. Shaidru is satisfied with the assassination and admits they never expected to actually prevent the merger. He also explains the origins of the Star Religious Group and claims they have no problem perishing with tension. Toji just finds him crazy and leaves with Shu Kong once the representative exits the room. While walking outside, Toji asks about some details of their mission mostly regarding the situation in Okinawa. Toji invites Shu Kong to get food using their new money, but he refuses, claiming he would only associate with Toji in work or in hell. Toji begins to leave when he's suddenly greeted by none other than Satoru Gojo in the flesh, back from the dead. Satoru is delirious from his newfound awakening and drunk on power. He claims Toji is going to lose because the sorcerer killer didn't chop his head off or use the inverted spear of heaven for the finishing blow. Toji rejects this claim and states they're just getting started. Belated, Satoru yells an agreement and approval before Toji charges at him at top speed. Satoru easily avoids Toji's blow and sends him back with his first ever successful activation of curse technique reversal, Red. The blow from Red sends Toji into the city but he doesn't suffer any serious injuries. As the awakened limitless user levitates in the air, smiling with satisfaction, Toji calls him a monster. Toji gets up and gathers his thoughts, reviewing all he knows about the limitless. He attaches the chain of a thousand miles to the inverted spear of heaven and swings it around, ready to take Satoru on. Toji looks up and meets Satoru's gaze, hesitating for a moment because he can feel something is off. However, Toji ignores this feeling and tells himself that this is fine. He sends the inverted spear of heaven at Satoru several times but the six eyes bearer is able to avoid it without much effort. Satoru apologizes for not feeling upset about Riko's death. He can only feel the high he's on at the moment and he feels amazing. While posing and looking down toward Toji, Satoru confidently proclaims that throughout heaven and earth, he alone is the honored one. Toji is from the Zenin clan, so he's aware of the Limitless's abilities. However, there is one technique that's known to few even within the Gojo clan. In a single shot, Satoru defeats Toji with the all-powerful hollow technique, Purple. As he's hit, Toji thinks back to telling himself that something is off. Normally he would have said I refuse to work for free, and then ran away immediately as soon as Satoru showed up. However, this time, Toji wanted to reject the Jujutsu world by killing the strongest sorcerer. However, this only ended up twisting Toji in an effort to affirm him. Now with nearly half of his body annihilated by purple, Toji admits that lost the moment he lost sight of who he was. Satoru asks if Toji has any last words and at first, Toji says that he doesn't. Toji thinks of Megumi again and reveals that his child will be sold off into the Zenin clan in two or three years, telling Satoru to do whatever he wants with that information. Later on, a recovered Suguru finds Toji's inventory cursed spirit and absorbs it before regrouping with Satoru. Suguru is surprised to find Satoru recovering Riko's body from the Time Vessel Association. He's even more surprised to see how Satoru has changed and asks what happened. Satoru takes responsibility for Riko's death and asks Suguru if they should kill all the non-sorcerers clapping around them, celebrating her demise. Suguru claims there's no point because the association will collapse before long, and Satoru asks if there needs to be a point as he walks out. Surrounded by ignorant non-sorcerers, Suguru faintly says that it's very important for there always to be a point, especially for Jujutsu sorcerers. It's August 2007, one year after the failed escort mission. Suguru and Shoko are helping Satoru display Suguru alone on his missions during a busy summer where cursed spirits were swarming one after another. He feels trapped in a mentally taxing cycle of constant exorcism and consumption of cursed spirits. This is an experience he likens to eating a dirty rack. He tries to escape the filth in the shower but is plagued with thoughts he's unable to wash away. For a year Suguru has been trying to convince himself to remain on the righteous path and be a jujutsu sorcerer that saves people. 
However, Suguru can't get the clapping of the children of the star from that incident out of his head. It blends with the rapidly falling water until Suguru cracks just slightly, muttering monkeys to himself. Afterward, Suguru sits in a lounge with a vending machine by himself. Yuhibara walks down the hallway and notices Suguru sitting alone and decides to join him. He enthusiastically tells Suguru about his upcoming mission and his upperclassman asks him about being a sorcerer. Suguru asks you if being a sorcerer is okay with him and if it's not too difficult. Yu replies that he isn't the type to think about it too hard and he wants to continue doing his best in whatever he can actually do well. The woman abruptly enters the room and asks what kind of women the boys like. Yu proudly responds that his ideal woman is one with a healthy appetite. Suguru is surprised Yu answered but the underclassman assures him that he can tell this woman is a good person. Yu gives Suguru and the woman the room. She introduces herself as Yuki Tsukumo, special grade sorcerer. Suguru recognizes Yuki's name as the sorcerer infamous for ignoring missions and bumming around overseas. At first, Yuki pouts as a joke and claims she hates Jujutsu High. In reality, Yuki feels as if Jujutsu Headquarters is only treating the symptoms of cursed spirits instead of curing the disease. She wants to create a world without Chen about achieving that end. Two ways for this to happen are if humanity breaks away from cursed energy so that nobody has it or optimizes cursed energy so everyone can control it. Toji Zenin was an ideal case for the former, as the only known person in the world with absolutely zero cursed energy. With his death, Yuki has to look into the latter option. She explains that sorcerers don't produce cursed spirits because they can control cursed energy and Suguru responds with the radical solution of killing all non-sorcerers. As Yuki goes through the logistics of doing so, Suguru begins to hear the clapping in his head overlapping with the rain outside. Yuki asks Suguru if he hates non-sorcerers, but he can't give a clear answer. There's a part of him that devalues and hates ugliness. Another part of him wants to reject that and walk the path of a righteous sorcerer. Yuki believes neither of those two sides are Suguru's true feelings or is. Yuki leaves after this conversation only sling off on her motorcycle. Yuki tells Suguru that Tenjin is stable due to another star plasma vessel appearing. Nanami returns early from his mission with Yu after it goes horribly wrong. Upset and throwing things across the morgue, Nanami exjutsu sorcerer to a marathon with only the body of his comrade's corpses awaiting him at the end. During a mission of his own, Suguru exercises a curse disturbing a village only for its misdeeds to be blamed on two young sorcerers. They are young girls that have been beaten and locked inside a cage. Suguru tries to explain that he dealt with the cause of the disturbances, but the villagers are convinced Suguru murdered non-sorcerers including his own parents and has been sentenced to death by headquarters. Satoru is furious but Yaga admits that he doesn't know what's going on anymore either. He wipes the blood from his face and mentally declares that he hates monkeys, fully committing to that feeling. Sometime later on, Satoru finds a young Megumi Fushiguro and greets him with a comically disgusted face due to his resemblance to Toji. Satoru starts to tell Megumi about his father and their relationship to the Zenin clan. He Satoru gleefully assures him it's nothing. Yuji, Megumi, and Nobara are walking around the city trying to decide what to do with their day. Megumi decides to return to Jujutsu High while Yuji tries to convince Nobara to see human earthworm 4 at the movies with him. He explains the plot and shows her the trailer for the movie, but Nobara isn't interested. As they go their separate ways, a teenage girl around their age watches from across the street. Meanwhile, AI to do and Mei Mei play ping pong after submitting their recommendations for promoting several Jujutsu High students to grade 1. To do is under the impression he will be able to mentor Yuji as he pursues the promotion. But Mei Mei bursts his bubble by reminding him that the person who recommended Yuji can't accompany him on his required missions. Completely deflated, Mei Mei defeats Tadu and Ping Pong. The girl who was watching Yuji earlier eventually works up the courage to approach Nomara. They agree to speak at a restaurant and the girl introduces herself as Yuko Azawa. She and Yuji went to middle school together when she was much shorter and chubbier. Her appearance has completely changed, and she gives Nobara hints that she would like to reunite with Yuji. Interested, Nobara asks it's like that, and Yuko confirms she has a crush on Yuji. Determined to help, Nobara gets Ajichi to take Megumi back into the city and has him dropped off at the restaurant. Nobara explains the situation and even Megumi asks, it's like that. He confirms that Yuji doesn't have a girlfriend and that he likes tall girls, giving Nobara and Yuko the confidence things might work out. Nobara summons Yuji into everyone's surprise. He recognizes Yuko without hesitation. Yuko quickly realizes that Yuji always saw more of her than just her appearance. She becomes ashamed of trying to impress him as if he's the same as the other boys who always judged her weight. 
Yuko decides not to reveal her feelings and leaves without getting Yuji's number. Megumi asks Nobara if this is alright, and the latter reveals she exchanged numbers with Yuko so it's fine. Yuji catches up with his two classmates shortly after and pressures them to go to the movies with him. Sometime later, the trio meets with Yudahai Mayori to investigate the mole at Jujutsu High. They investigate the place where Kakichi Muda's real body is located. They believe Kakichi Muda, also known as Mekamaru, must be the mole by process of elimination. His technique, puppet manipulation, is the only one capable of pulling off long-range surveillance. At Kyoto Jujutsu High, Kasumi Miwa reminds Mekamaru it's the last day to turn in their notebooks, but the puppet tells Kasumi that he needs to rest for now. He anticipates visitors but not Yudaheim and the others. They discover a false hideout, confirming that Kikichi is the traitor. Kikichi actually meets with Gido and Mahito who have entered a binding vow with him to fix his body in exchange for information. Mahito wants to kill Kakichi, but Gido sternly warns him about the backlash from breaking a vow with others. The cursed spirit begrudgingly heals Kakichi's body with idle transfiguration, and the two of them decide to settle their differences right then. And there, Kakichi calls multiple Mekamaru puppets to his side and sends them to his opponent. Mahito quickly dispatches them but Kakichi disappears before blowing up the hideout entirely. Enchin rises from the water, Mekamaru mode, absolute. This colossal version of Mekamaru is piloted by Kakichi from the inside. He's saved up 17 years of cursed energy and plans to survive by using it to defeat Mahito. He knows his chances of victory are slim and his survival hinges on him being able to contact Satoru Gojo to rescue him. Having recorded everything that's happened up to this point, Kakichi believes he has the knowledge to win. Meanwhile, at Kyoto Jujutsu High, Kasumi Miwa sits next to the sleeping Mekamaru puppet and expresses how she enjoys that the students have gotten closer since the baseball game. It traps civilians inside and they're told they won't be able to leave until Satoru Gojo arrives. Several teams of Jujutsu sorcerers are placed outside the curtain as a precaution. These teams include sorcerers such as Megumi Fushiguro, Takuma Ino, Kento Nanami, Nobara Kujisaki, Maki Zenin, Neobito Zenin, Panda, and Atsuya Kusake. Managers inform each squad of the situation and gives them their orders to stand by and take out anything that gets past Satoru once he goes inside. There's no cellular signal in however. Kusakabe notes that there are definitely special grave cursed spirits waiting underground. Around 8.31pm, Satoru Gojo arrives and enters the curtain. 